Well, I bid you all welcome this morning, those of you who have assembled for the special baptismal service of three of the children of John and Crystal Kelly, Caleb, Connor, and Audrey. Very glad to welcome each one of you here, and of course the Kelly family for this event as well. It's been a blessing uh, this weekend already to have had baptismal services, to have uh, baptized three of our young people on Friday evening, and to have the privilege of baptizing these three children also. So we're going to keep the service fairly simple. We'll sing, and then we'll pray, and then I'll have a message on the subject of baptism, and then we'll have the baptisms themselves, and then we'll sing again before we try to close everything up for 10.30 so that the rest of our morning can get underway. But we do welcome you all. Thank you for coming, and may the Lord's blessing be upon you. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon a little child. We trust that will be the case for all of our children, that the Lord will be pleased to make them His own and regenerate their hearts and call them to serve Him. We're going to pray. Let's seek the Lord and look for His blessing upon us here this morning. Our Father, we gather here this morning for a special occasion once again. How thankful we are to Thee for thy mercy in all of our lives, and to think of thy particular mercy upon the family that assembles here this morning to present their children in this ordinance of baptism. It is a unique blessing. These children do not yet fully comprehend the blessings that have been bestowed upon them in thy mercy, the kind providence of God that has placed them into a family before parents that love the Lord Jesus and desire to raise their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. We're thankful that all the families here in this church have unique blessings. We're thankful, Lord, that you've been pleased to give to parents the desire to bring the gospel to our little ones, that they might know the God who has saved us and that the blessing of the forgiveness of sins might be imparted to them. We understand, Lord, that salvation utterly and totally depends upon Thee. None of us can save ourselves, and none of us can save our little ones. And yet we know, Lord, that Thou hast been pleased generally through the passage of time to bless the efforts of parents as they have sought to bring their little ones to Christ. 
It has been largely through this that Thy church has been preserved and kept from one generation to the next. Lord, we pray that once again that may be the case, not just in the outward, but in the inner, that these children might know Christ for themselves, and that that which is signified by baptism this morning might become a reality in their own lives. God, give help this morning. Forgive us our sins. Help us, Lord, this day, each and every one of us who have been baptized and made profession of Thy mercy toward us. May we all again be stimulated to see again, signified before us, the cleansing from sin, union with Christ, and the blessing of belonging to the people of God. So God be with us here in this place. May the Spirit of God open up the Word, and may we know what it is to be instructed and taught. And again, may this family particularly know the blessing of Thy presence and comfort. So draw near and do us good, and we give to Thee all the praise and the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I invite you this morning, beloved, to turn to Acts chapter 2, the book of Acts chapter 2. And I want to read a few verses with you here and then give some consideration to the Word of God. We have the privilege in this church to which we belong of um, our conviction before God being able to be played out within the body of Christ that whatever our conviction may be in terms of baptism, of course not sliding into the air of baptismal regeneration or any other heresy that may be held, but understanding that within the legitimate body of Christ there are some differing views, especially when it comes to the uh, subjects of baptism as we're concerned with this morning. There is the openness of the individual before God being able to practice according to their conscience in this place. It's a great blessing. It's one that I treasure. I truly do. And as much as I delight in Friday night, I delight in what's going on this morning as well, because all of it is an indication of the mercy of God and His blessings toward us and to the families that are part of our church. And so this morning, I'm going to set before you uh, just some of the ideas that would bring one to do what is being done this morning. Again, it is not with the intention of uh, trying to bring you to this persuasion, but simply clarification. Um, for you to understand, it is certainly a subject of uh, great debate, and my intention is not so much to debate it as it is just to explain why uh, John and Crystal would desire to do what they are doing this morning. So Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 37, it is the day of Pentecost, and Peter is preaching. He brings Old Testament Scriptures to bear upon the hearts of his hearers and has a very pointed message for them. And then we read in verse 37, that when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. When parents bring their children to be baptized, it is often, not always, but often in part their understanding of this text. I want to say carefully that that's not always the case. There are some that in the history of the church have not seen this as an argument for infant baptism, to be quite honest with you, but the vast majority have. They've seen a significance in the language of Peter that would encourage them to uh, continue to present their children in such a way that they are seen before God as part of the body, at least visibly, outwardly, part of the body that would identify with being the people of God. So, before I bring clarity to this uh, text, I want you to understand that, of course, this is not how it is universally understood, uh, perhaps even 
those this morning that do not hold to infant baptism would not see the text in this way. If you're wondering how that may be understood, I quote to you the language of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. I think he would give a, a kind of overview with his language in how this text is perceived by those who would not baptize their children. He says here concerning verse 39, the promise is unto you and to your children. He says, clearly what is meant by children is this, not their physical descendants, not their own personal children. What the apostle is saying is the promise is not only for you who are immediately here now, it's for the next generation and the generation after that and after that. It's going to continue down the centuries, not only for Jews, but also for those who are far off, the Gentiles, those who are outside the commonwealth of Israel. Indeed, it is for as many as the Lord our God shall call, not your children because you were baptized, not those who came, come in subsequent generations and all others whom God is going to call throughout the generations. Simply what Lloyd-Jones is presenting there is, is an understanding that what God is doing here in this generation, he will be pleased to do in subsequent generations to come. That is to save men by their repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. But the reason many of our Reformed forefathers did not view it this way, and really the vast majority of the history of the church have not viewed it in this way, I believe they understand it that in a different context, in a different way than Lloyd-Jones, because they take time to hear what Peter is saying with a Jewish perspective in mind. They try to place themselves there, not within the context of our individualistic social order, but to hear it as Jews would hear it. And I want us to at least try and place ourselves in that position this morning with what I have entitled Children of Abraham, Children of Abraham. And a few things just to point out, and we'll be going through some scriptures trying to give some clarity to why someone might see this language in the way that it is understood by those who bring their children for baptism. First, the significance of Abraham. The significance of Abraham. Under this, I want you to note firstly that Abraham is called the father of us all. He is called that in Romans chapter 4 verse 16, as well as in James chapter 2 verse 21, he is called Abraham our father. There is therefore a significance to Abraham, not just to the Jews and not just to the Old Testament era, but a significance to Abraham that existed to the New Testament church that they were to look to Abraham as signifying something, as symbolizing something, as identifying of a certain way in which he, under God, was led to uh, grasp the gospel, the promises that were given to him, that make him, in some sense, the father of all them that believe. It would be odd then for he who was named the father of all, at least all that believe, to be excluded from what we understand ourselves to be as a body. We, we call ourselves a church today. We identify as a visible body. We come together. We say, this is the church. We recognize that not everyone within the visible body truly knows Christ. We understand that. But at the same time, we say, this is the body. This is an outward expression of those that belong to the Lord. And this has always been the case. And Abraham, in that sense, is the father of bringing together a body, identifying a body that are separated from the world and onto God. He was not the first to be saved. We know that. You read Hebrews chapter 11, it goes before Abraham, speaks of Abel, speaks of others, signifying that they too knew the Lord and were saved. But Abraham, in how God dealt with him, becomes this father of an assembled body. In this way, he is the father of us all, as Paul says. Secondly, Abraham was given promises that have significance to us. He was given promises that have significance to us, not just to those who would follow him, and then it stops with the coming of Christ. But to this day, he was given promises that we should treasure and hold on to and that matter to the church. And so, we read in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. 
So you have a number of things here. First, you have the gathering of a nation. Indicated in this language, God is going to gather a nation under Abraham. You have the giving of a land. And thirdly, the guarantee of a blessed seed that would infiltrate every nation. Now, Paul indicates the significance of these words are not exclusive to the Old Testament. He's, he draws them into the New Testament era and applies them to the experience of Gentiles, of believers living today. So, in Galatians chapter 3, he indicates their significance when he says, in verse 8 and 9, the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. And so, he says in verse 9, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. He is taking the language that God gave to Abraham, and he's saying this is being lived out, this is being experienced even now. Now, my point then to underline is simply this. There is a significance to Abraham, not one that is left to the dusty past, but one that is right up to date to the present, one that we can't ignore, one that the New Testament underlines. Secondly, we have the sign given to Abraham the sign given to Abraham, not only the significance of Abraham, but the sign given to him. And we see here, firstly, as Abraham looked for the fulfillment of the promise, God distinguished those inside and outside the visible believing body by a sign. When giving Abraham a promise, a promise that is still relevant to you and to me, according to Paul in Galatians chapter 3, in doing so, he also gave to Abraham a sign. God could have left Abraham simply with the word of promise. He could have said to Abraham, here's my promise to you, and left it at that. And Abraham and his descendants would simply be uh, treasuring the promises and not looking for anything beyond that. But instead, he gives a sign that identifies, firstly, those looking for the promise, secondly, their children, and thirdly, the nations of the earth who are without the sign. By giving a sign that we know is circumcision, he said, here are those who believe, they take the mark. Also their children are to receive the same mark, and anyone who does not see, receive this mark in this way then is outside. So you have three categories of people. Reading some verses that you may glean from Genesis chapter 17, we read there, verses 3 and 4, God talked with him, that's Abraham saying, as for me, Behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. So there it is. It's to you. My covenant is with you, Abraham. And what follows is, of course, he will, since this is the case, receive a sign, because God's covenant is with him. Then in verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. So it's not just to thee. Now, verse 7 underlines that it's also to the seed that come to those that are born to you. Verse 10 and 11, this is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Here it is. Here's how you evidence, evidence that you're holding on to it. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Here's a sign. I've given you the promise. I've told you what I intend to do. But amidst your doubting heart, amidst the uncertainty of the future and how others will hold on to this, here will be a sign that will help distinguish those that truly have laid hold of the promise as well as their children as being set apart from the rest of the world. And so then we read later in the chapter, Abraham took Ishmael his son and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day as God had said unto him. So he takes all, including those that did not believe, and indeed would not believe, and gives to them this mark. So that brings us secondly to see about this sign, that it's not only something that God gave to distinguish those who are inside and outside the visible body, but the sign is paired with discipleship. It is a clear pairing with discipleship. It has an understanding that it's not just, here, we're going to do this and just leave you to yourself. But with the sign, there's the understanding that there would be the teaching and education of those that receive the sign. So, in the very next chapter, 
In Genesis chapter 18, verses 17 through 19, we read that the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. Abraham had believed before he received the sign. Ishmael received the sign even though he would not believe. And Isaac received the sign before he would even have the opportunity to believe. He would be too young to believe at that point, certainly in the outward sense. But the common denominator upon all who received the sign was that they were under discipleship. They were being instructed. They were being taught. The sign is always paired with, married with, discipleship. Now, when you think of that, when you recognize that you have a sign that here are the people, and you have the certainty that they will be taught, it brings you to consider the clear indication uh, that is given by the Lord Jesus of the future of the church. So the sign given to Abraham is not just that which separates those who are believing and their children from the world. It's not just an indication that they should be discipled and will be discipled, but Thirdly, believers are now called to baptize, not circumcise, those under their discipleship. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now, if you just take for a moment, just step back and think about what Jesus is saying there. It would have been Abraham's idea to go and all that he would buy, all that he would bring into his household, his goal would be to go forth to circumcise and teach. That was his goal. That's what he did that day when God gave him that command, to circumcise and teach, or teach and circumcise, whatever the order might be. But you have these coming together. That was Abraham's command, and that's what God was assured Abraham would do. But these disciples are given new instruction. They are told, yes, you teach, but the sign is different. Now you must baptize them in the name of the triune God. And this is what we have been doing for 2,000 years, baptizing people along with teaching them. And what has been understood by those who include their children is that there's a continuity here, that they're still receiving a sign not just to those who outwardly profess, but to their children also, as they will be under the discipleship of believing parents. Fourthly, since the Abrahamic covenant of promise and its inclusion of children remains, those that believe in their children receive the sign as before. This underlines what I've just said. The Abrahamic covenant is significant. I've already outlined this, and I want you to understand it. This doesn't pass away. When Israel became a nation, the promises made to Abraham got swallowed up by the law and the ceremony to Israel as a nation. They became significant, of course, and they were to follow this as God had commanded. But often the out outward, the external, that which they were called to do was what they trusted in, and they missed the promise that was continuing. We read in Galatians chapter 3, and you may want to turn there because this is very important to understand. Galatians 3, verse 17 and 18. As Paul is detailing this and making a distinction between the Mosaic Covenant, which was given for a purpose of exposing the sins of a large group of people who were prone to sin, prone to rebel, and so the law is given to hold them together to maintain a people through which the promise would come, but it was never intended to be what they would trust in or the final thing that they would rest in. It, was, it had a termination point with Christ, but that was not the same for what God said, said to Abraham. Galatians 3.17, this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ the law, which was 430 years after, so he's making a distinction here, a covenant of Abraham, which was given over 400 years prior to the law. Then you have the law given during the time of Moses, but that which was initially given, that covenant that was given, cannot disannul. The law cannot disannul. It can't remove that it should make the promise of none effect. 
For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And what Paul is saying is that what was given to Abraham continues. And when we come to Moses, yes, there is an enveloping of all of that, and additionally, all that's given concerning the ceremonial law and the civil law and so on and so forth, all of that is swallowed up into the promise, but it was to be terminated. And when you come to Hebrews chapter 8 and it talks about the old passing away, giving way to the new, that is what is removed and taken away. But the undergirding promise given to Abraham continues. It is still significant. It is promise. It has nothing to do with our contribution. It has nothing to do in terms of judgment. It is all promise. It is all that which gives hope to the sinner. This is what God is going to do. And in that, Abraham believed, and he gave the sign that indicated it to his children and all in his household. And what I'm saying to you is, when you read the New Testament, and Paul's argumentation, he is establishing that what you trust in, believer, what you believe in, is rooted in what God promised to Abraham. Now, that being the case, then, why then would we remove our children? Why would we forsake that part of what God promised to Abraham? And that, of course, is the question of debate. That brings us then thirdly to consider the subdivision given to Abraham. The subdivision given to Abraham. Going back to the original text we read Acts chapter 2, verse 39, says, the promise is unto you and to your children. So, this is language of promise. This, when you read this about promise, it is distinct from what was given at Sinai and all that was related to Moses. Now, it's involved there. The promise still permeated the day of Moses. It wasn't removed. It was there at the heart of it, and even in all the ceremonies that were given, it was pointing to the promise. But when Peter is speaking of promise, his mind is on what God said to Abraham. He's not thinking about what God said to Moses in his day. He's thinking about what God said to Abraham. He's standing before a people who declare themselves to be, we be of Abraham's seed. And these people believed that their children were part of what they were part of. Some of them were proselytes. Some of them had been Gentiles that didn't believe, but they had come to understand things as the Jew, Jew understood them, and they had brought their children to the same thing. And they had had their sons circumcised and so on. All of that was still continuing. And what Peter is doing, because for many of them, they were looking at the law of Moses. They were considering what they were doing in terms of the outward. And they had lost heart of the promise. And Peter is reminding them of the promise. Don't miss the promise. The promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. That is encapsulating the distinctions that God made in terms of the world to Abraham. There is you, there are your children, and there are everyone else. And what he is indicating here, I put to you, is that there's a significance still to the children. They are not to be excluded. It's still there. And therefore, the sign that marks that we are the people of God, which, as I said, is no longer circumcision. We're not sending the apostles out to circumcise, sending them out to baptize and teach. Since that is the case, the children also should receive the same sign. If we take it as Lloyd-Jones takes it, if we understand it in that way, as many do, then really what Peter is saying in verse 39 is, is redundant. It doesn't have any significance whatsoever. It's basically just saying, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, which is what Peter's already declared, quoting from Joel chapter 2. If you believe, you'll be saved. If we understand it in that way, the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, he's basically just saying, whosoever believes will be saved. If you believe, you'll be saved. The next generation, if they believe, they'll be saved. Anyone in the world, if they believe, they'll be saved. But that has always been the case. 
That's always been the case. Is there? It's never not been like that. And so having already quoted Joel chapter 2, the question is, why would he divide it this way? What's the significance of this language? Why is he giving this? And I suggest again, he has Abraham in mind. And this is how he categorizes the world. And so the children are not seen just as another generation that should believe and so on. And then when they believe, they should be baptized. But the children are seen as recipients of the blessings along with their parents. And they should also receive the same sign that they were coming forward to receive. This understanding of the distinction of our children was something clearly that was in the mind of the New Testament church and the believers. It was not in their mind to just relegate children to basically being like on the children of the heathen. And that is proven by the difficulty that arose, at least among some, in the Corinthian church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, the apostle has to address a concern. And the concern is this. What position do my children have if my spouse is not a believer? How am I to view them? I mean, you read 1 Corinthians 7, 14, when Paul answers this, the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else we are children unclean, but now are they holy. Clearly, if you had two believing parents, there was no question about whether or not the children were distinct. None whatsoever. The question only arose when one of the parents was not a believer. Does that make a difference? So, in the problem that arose in Corinth, it was not whether or not the children of believers are distinct and different. If both parents believe, that was already taken as a given. And coming out of the Old Testament era, you, <laughs> you'd have been up against great opposition to, con to persuade any Jew that that was not the case. If that was the case... If it was the case that on the day of Pentecost, all of a sudden, children no longer were seen in the way they were in the past, you have the greatest excommunication that the church has ever known. At that point, children now are relegated to nothing. And there's no way that would have been understood in the mind of the Jews. This was understood then. The only question was, what about our children if one of the parents is not a believer? And Paul underlines, still, still they are holy. Still they are sanctified. They are set apart. So that is just some little insight into the reason why some baptize their children. It's not everything. I couldn't do that possibly this morning. And let me underscore, let me underscore plainly to you. What happens this morning is not going to in any way give any guarantee that these children will profess faith in Christ and walk with Him all the days of their lives. We're not doing this because by doing this, we are assured in our obedience to this, they will definitely follow on with Christ. We're not doing it because of that. It is simply a conviction that this is what the Lord would call us to do. We belong to Him. We believe our children, therefore, have a distinction in the church, and they are to receive that sign, that one sign, the only sign of terms of being part or membership or involvement in the church. They are to receive the sign of baptism, and the hope is, the trust is, our prayer is that all the blessings that are bestowed upon them will not be in vain. God in His providence has blessed these children in a way that is not true of all children. We should see that. These children this morning are not like every other or all other children in the world. There are countless millions upon millions who have not what they have. 
And so in the providence of God, we see, we see already the mercy of God in giving to them parents that believe. And we're recognizing that providence and trusting that it will not be in vain, that under the discipleship of Christian parents, God will use the means of grace to be instrumental in the salvation of their souls. And we look for that day in anticipation and in hope. May the Lord bless His Word, and may He be with us here at this time. I'd ask John and Crystal to come forward now as we intend to baptize Caleb, Connor, and Audrey, and we'll do so in that order, and if they can come to the front. is the, uh, again, part of our church's position that all uh, modes of baptism are also acceptable. And whenever I speak to anyone about baptism, whether it's themselves or their children, of course, the question is, by what mode do you wish to be baptized? And in the case of Friday evening, we had three that were immersed, and this morning we will have three that will be poured and again, that's an acceptable form of baptism as we understand it, and scripturally, it can be argued very clearly as well. So, we have each of them, and this is Caleb. Caleb, you're going to be baptized now, okay? And I'm going to baptize you, and I'm going to do so just now. Caleb, I baptize you this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious to thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Do you want to bring Audrey first? Audrey, I baptize you this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And Connor. <laughs> You're looking for me. Caleb? Connor, pardon me. <laughs> I baptize thee in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Let us all pray. Lord, we understand but this morning, these parents have brought their children to be baptized in an understanding of your mercy and blessing upon them and their children. We are thankful, dear God, that you, in your mercy, have been pleased to place them into these families, into this family, and that you have mercifully opened up your heart to them in this way. We pray, dear God, that you'll remember John and Crystal as they raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. We pray that you'll be pleased to help them understand by your wisdom how to lead these children. And we pray, gracious God, that you'll be pleased to save them early in life. God, hear our prayers. Be merciful. We are so thankful again for your kindness toward us. And we pray that this family would know that underneath and round about them are the everlasting arms of a God who is mighty to save and to deliver. Hear us this morning. Help us to rejoice in your goodness. And we pray that all of our families will be found in the arms of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'll ask our brother Paul if he'll come and lead us in song now. Thank you. And now, O oh, give us homes built firm upon the Savior. Christ's head. 
friend and counselor and guide. And we'll stand once again. Lord, we are thankful again that you do bless our homes. And all of us here this morning can testify to your blessing upon our homes. And yet, Lord, there may be some yet without Christ, some of our children, some of them young and some of them older, who are not saved. And we pray that you in your mercy would remember them. And even should there be a Manasseh that's found reflected in any of the families of our congregation, we pray that you'll be merciful to them today and bring them to yourself. Bless us then again. Bless all our homes. Help us, O God, to know that the fear of the Lord is upon us. The power of the Spirit is given to us. And we can labor in the hope that Christ is able and mighty to save. Lord, we pray, grant it. Hear our prayers for our little ones. And may it please thee, God in heaven, to continue through one generation to the next, to save and to deliver. Hear then these are prayers and bless us as we anticipate our morning service today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.